My name is Charlene Margo, and I am co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture, the organization that brings you this program, the Parent Education Series. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about today's featured presenter. Dr. Iran McGann earned his MA in education and PhD in psychology from Stanford University. And he completed his postdoctoral training in population health at the University of Pennsylvania. He served as the research director for the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Counseling and Psychological Services before founding his organization, Parenting for Humans. Dr. McGann works with public school districts, universities, hospitals, and private organizations to teach educators, clinicians, and parents how to build stronger, more joyful relationships in their personal and professional lives. Please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for Dr. Iran McGann. Hi, Iran. Hello. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation as usual. Also, thank you, Emily, for showing your face. <clears throat> I appreciate that very much. It's nice not to talk into the voice. Oh, the void. And Kimberly, too. Thank you, Kimberly, too. Hello. Um, so I'll talk for a little bit about this, and then hopefully we can all talk a little more about this or about anything else that you'd like to talk about. Um, you can get the slides from the URL below. We'll put the URL in the chat later uh, in case you, you actually want them. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll start. So the main thing I want to say right at the top is that good job, you know, just, just for coming, just for being here and taking time to think a little bit about parenting. Um, I, I, th I think it's great. It's not obvious at all that you would actually take time to, to think about how to do um, all of this, all of parenting usually just kind of flies by us and it's nice that you're taking time to think about it. Um, I also want to say just, you know, in case you were thinking differently that I am actually not perfect and that all of the things that I'll tell you are aspirational for me as well, right? I do as much of them as I can, but sometimes I don't because life is hard and parenting is tricky. And so, you know, the goal here is not to make lists about what we do right and what we do wrong, but rather, you know, see if we can pick up some ideas and things that can be helpful. And along the same lines, I also want to say that I'm not, I'm not claiming any, um, you know, special access to the truth, capital T, right? What I'll tell you is based on experience and based on research and based on opinion, um, a combination of all of those. And so if you disagree with any of it, totally fine. Uh, also, we can talk about it. Um, if some of it strikes you as potentially useful, then wonderful. Um, my hope is that you'll come out of today with, with at least an idea to, to try, to maybe do differently or to think about differently. But that's really it. Okay, so to our topic. Um, as a, as a framework, I think a lot in terms of the relational bank account, this idea that there's uh, uh, an amount of goodwill between two people that is really determined by the, the balance of actions that we take with one another. And so when goodwill is really high, if your child has a lot of goodwill toward you, relational account credit is very, very high. That's kind of fantasy scenario, right? That's breakfast in bed by surprise, coming back to a clean home, all these you know, things that they write about, um, where your child will spontaneously sit down and think, how can I make my parent happy? If things are pretty good, if relational balance is pretty high, you'll see a lot of cooperation, really minimal nudging uh, that's needed, kind of general cheerful cooperation. Things are going pretty well, by and large. If relational balance is low, your child may or may not cooperate. Cooperating may require a little more nudging or a little more, you know, kind of forceful reminders um, and doesn't doesn't work majority of the time necessarily easily. <clears throat> and then over in that part of life is a, is a trap that we can fall into, which is forcing our child to do things that we want done uh, using using the power that we have over them. And in that case, we might actually uh, end up with an overdraft in the relational credit, right? And when it's negative, it's kind of the the mirror image of when it's very, very high, <clears throat> which is when your child sits there and plots ways to make you annoyed, uh, to just kind of derail things a little bit and get back at you. 
Um, so that's that's a place obviously we never want to get to, both in terms of comfort and ease in our lives, but also because it's just it's not a good relationship with our kid, and that's not where we want to be. But these are ways that you can think about also asking what what is my relational balance with my kid right now? How much goodwill does my kid have toward me? Where do I fall on these? Just to kind of get a, a little dipstick test. So the relational account, um, the the balance really is a, a measure of goodwill, the amount of goodwill that the other person, the, your kid, has toward you. And the balance is made up of deposits and withdrawals, right? To make the balance higher, you make more deposits than withdrawals. And if you want to deplete for some reason, you just flip it around. So deposits into relational accounts. Oh, that's right. So here are all the good things that happen when the account balance is high, right? When you have a lot of relational credit. Your kid trusts you more. Right, is more honest and vulnerable with you out of the trust, right? We'll put more effort into requests that you make. We'll forgive you when you make mistakes. We'll cooperate more easily, more cheerfully. Very good things kind of come out of uh, good relationships. And I, I think, I really believe that everything becomes easier when the relationship is easier. And so I, I primarily orient toward relationship, almost, almost always. Like as long as there's not danger, I prioritize improving the relationship solidifying more and more and more and more because my goal is for my kid to trust me and to want to come to me when there's a problem right and to be comfortable sharing things that went well or not well so deposits deposits really at an abstract level are made by showing care and showing respect and if you can communicate i care about you you made a deposit if you can communicate i respect you you made a deposit. And withdrawals are made by either showing that you don't care or that you don't respect the other person. Or when you ask the other person, when you ask your kid to inconvenience him or herself on your behalf, meaning to do something that your kid would not spontaneously do, which is normally what happens in the course of life. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. This is part of what relationships are about. We do things for each other. It's it's fine. So the trick here is to try to withdraw only as much as necessary and no more, and to deposit frequently as much as possible. So how to do that a little bit more concretely then. Here are examples of ways that you could be making little deposits, little ongoing deposits. I'll talk about some of them in a little bit more detail. Um, and these are all simple, small things. And uh, the main message here is that there are lots of opportunities throughout the day to just make these, you know, five cent deposits as, as you walk past your kid, right? As you, as you connect or interact with your kid. And if you make good use of many of these opportunities, you will end up overflowing with, with goodwill, right? Or your kid will be overflowing with goodwill toward you. Um, and and they're, they're well within reach. And that's generally the strategy that I advocate for rather than the occasional like big drop of something enormous, because um, it's usually not, not sustainable. So ideally you build habits that leave you making deposits all the time without even thinking about it, without trying very hard. So here are some examples of things you could be doing that are listed there. I'll focus on a couple of those that I think are very, very kind of low hanging fruit, things that occur frequently during the day. Um, and these are all, I'll also say, these are all sort of um, tip of the iceberg, uh, uh, review, a tip of the iceberg review that I'll do, right? We do separate sessions here that focus in depth about how to explain the benefit of what you're proposing to do to your child, right? We just spend an hour doing that. So it, it can get a lot more focused. So I'm, ju I'm just doing, a, you know, fairly shallow review of those. But thanking your kid, there are probably opportunities to thank your kid. And the more you can find them and focus on them and then express your gratitude sincerely, right? Not overblowing it, but just sincerely and really concretely. What is it that I'm thankful for? Thank you for putting the dishes away. 
you know, that was really nice of you to, you know, put away this thing or to clean the thing or to take the dog out. You know, when I didn't ask you, I really appreciate it. Something like that, right? That's a nice five cent deposit. So just finding the opportunities and remembering to, to do it. It's easy to fall into this trap of, you know, that's kind of expected behavior. So why do I need to mention it? Um, but you're just missing an opportunities to, to, to build a relationship when, when you're not thinking. There's also the, the deeper philosophical question of whether or not it's really expected behavior and should not be thanked. Because in reality, nobody owes anybody anything, right? I mean, your kid could choose to do anything they wanted, and then you could choose to do something in response or not do. Um, but they don't actually have to be nice. Like there's no, they're not, most of them are not genetically predisposed, right? Like they're making a choice uh, to be nice. And that's worth acknowledging and seeing. Okay, um, explaining benefit to your child, which I mentioned before a little bit, is when when we make a request of our child or give a direction even, or even when we say no about certain things that they really want, um, to be transparent and clear and intentional about explaining why we are making this request or even why we're saying no and how it translates into benefit for your child. So a simple example um, is if you say something like, uh, you know, I, I know that you really wanna go do this other thing that I need to drive you to and I would love to, right? Um, it takes me a long time to clean up after you, clean your room, get your laundry, do the whatever, right? So if you're able to help with this, I'll have more time to do this other thing that I know you want to do. And the the goal here in, in my, again, in my fantasy world is, is not to be uh, inventing reasons or not to be inventing sort of trade-offs that make it reasonable for your kid to, to do what you're asking, but, but actually talk about the real reality of it, right? If, you know, if you're not helping with this, I just won't have time to do this other thing. And so would you be willing to do this so that we can do this other thing you really want? Alternatively, if your kid has a goal that's really important for your kid, your kid wants to get into, you know, soccer or the the the, the town junior symphony or, you know, whatever it is that your kid is into, right? And you're trying to be on top of it and you're saying, well, you need to practice and you need to go to, to keep linking it back to the bigger goal. And saying, I, I remember you said that you really want to get on the soccer team at school, right? And, you know, at this point, it sounds like they're going to be testing you on, what do they test people on soccer? I don't know, test uh, running, passing, uh, uh, hitting the ball hard and making it fly far. Um, and, and this is why I'm suggesting that we spend some time practicing, right? Because I know you want to get onto the team. Just that, just not forgetting that step of explaining how it connects to, to the benefit in the back. Um, respectful redirects, right? Just as much as possible to be respectful to our kid, like pretending that our kid is an adult that has some level of power and agency um, can, can help moderate how we talk to our kid, right? So if our kid is, uh, you know, eating from a potato chip in the living room on the pristine couch, Right, it's very tempting to to snap or say something that is not totally respectful, right? But there's there's nothing stopping us from saying, "Could you please eat this in the dining room?" Right, as opposed to any any other way of doing it. And this would be a way of of minimizing a withdrawal, right? Make making it making sure it's not bigger than it needs to be. Because of course we ask our kids to do things all the time. <clears throat> But the withdrawal can be very small if it's respectful. It can be very big if it's disrespectful or angry. And it can sometimes be a deposit if we do a good job of explaining the benefit to our child. In the case of the potato chip, I don't know that there's gonna be a, a benefit to like not watching TV and going to the dining room or whatever. But in other cases, when, when we're saying, please don't do this, do that, because then you could blah, blah, blah. That can end up becoming a deposit if you do it really well. So just remembering essentially to be respectful and polite when telling your kid to do something or to not do something that they're doing. Consulting is something that I'm a huge fan of. Um, 
And that's a little bit different than, than the others in the everyday lifeness of it. So consulting is when you talk to your, when you decide things together with your kid, basically, right? And I'm, I'm a huge fan of doing that as much as possible, including about important things, including when kids are pretty young, right? So to be able to, you know, it can start from consulting about, you know, what we want to have for dinner or, uh, you know, which clothes to wear today and uh, what time should we go do this thing or we're planning to go see a movie and which one you'll want to see and things like that. So all of these are ways to involve your kid. They're a great show of respect. They are um, meaningful deposits into the relational account, right? When you are consulting with your child about these things. But even beyond that, when you're trying to work on things that are just about your kid and just for your kid, right? Coming up with a good schedule to do homework, coming up with a good exercise routine, coming up with a way to, you know, whatever study for something that's going on. It's tempting again to go in and just say how it's gonna be and then watch your kid not do it and then get annoyed uh, and then have these back and forth. It's easier, I think, and, and much, um, much more comfortable to have a sit down and say, you know, we talked about the, the notes that you've been getting at school. They're worried that you're not submitting the things on time. And I would start from the, like, if it were me, I would start from the very beginning question, asking about motivation. I would say, how important is it for you to be submitting things on time? Like, let's just start by figuring out if this is even important to you or am I the only person worried about it or what? And if your kid goes, I'm not worried about submitting late, then you might have a conversation about that, right? Like, why is it important or not important? Maybe you'll be convinced, maybe not, right? But that's what has to be addressed before you start talking about, let's build a schedule for doing this thing. Um, or for those of you interested in, in background reading, this is these are essentially motivational interviewing. It's, an, it's the motivational interviewing approach. Um, that says just behavioral change is not going to happen before motivation changes unless you force someone, right? And forcing hurts the relationship. That's no good. It means you need to be on top of them all the time. They're not doing it because they're they're internally motivated. They only do it when you're watching and threatening, basically, or or rewarding. So right from the top, right? What's your motivation for doing this? School sent notes, blah, blah, blah. How do you feel about those notes? I don't know. Do you feel like it's important? Like for you, how important is it to submit things on time? I don't know. Does it affect anything? My grades, I guess. How important are your grades for you? Kind of important. You know, how are grades important? So these things take time. But if you if you hit on alignment, and the conversation doesn't have to be this difficult every time, right? It might be like, yeah, I want to be able to submit earlier, but it's tough. And, you know, things always kind of jump at me in the last moment. You're like, okay. What do you think are, or do you want some suggestions for like ways that I do it or ways you could do it? Or do you have thoughts about what you could do? And right, and really consult and build a system. And part of what you're teaching here, what you're modeling is um, um, collaborating, collaborative problem solving. And part of what you're modeling is open-mindedness because they might suggest solutions that you know are absolutely idiotic, right? But if they're not dangerous, it's worth trying because if you say okay to their suggested solutions, they're much more likely to say okay to your suggested solutions, right? So maybe you say something like, okay, let's try this for a week and then reconvene and see what happened, right? So consulting is a much slower path to, uh, to decision-making, right? But a, a much faster path to collaboration. And I'm, I'm, I just cannot say enough about what a huge fan I am of, of that. And again, we have separate sessions that are basically all just on that um, collaborative problems, collaborative problem solving and helping your kids build good habits and such. The last one that I highlighted here is this idea of one tasking, right? Not dividing your attention between your kid and something else. Being very clear when you're focused on your kid to be focused on your kid. And when you're not, not. And sometimes you have to do other things and sometimes you want to do other things. That's okay. You have a life too, you're a person, right? But to not, to not try to double task it, to not try to like talk with them while being on your phone, talk with them while, you know, playing with someone else, talk with them while whatever it is, right? 
So as much as possible, one tasking, which means that maybe, I'm gonna try to move this because I think the light is doing a blinky thing. Um, as much as possible, if you're in the middle of something else and they're coming to talk with you, say, let me just wrap this up and then wrap it up and then put it aside and then focus just on that. If you wanna to switch to something else, say, I'm gonna do this other thing for a few minutes, okay? And then I'll, but don't, don't give them divided attention. Don't model dividing your attention, right? And again, the more you do it with them, the more they'll do it with you. Uh, one tasking, I mean, the more, the more you pay them total attention, the more they'll pay you total attention. How nice will that be? Okay, so these are all examples of things you can be doing really throughout the course of a day. And there are many others that are listed here and then many others that are not listed here. All these are examples of just little deposits that you can make throughout the day to either you know, make deposits or uh, make sure that you're not withdrawing more than necessary when you're asking them to do things. A couple of tips. Live transcription, terrifying. Okay, um, a couple of tips. Um, constant deposits throughout the day win over big deposits every once in a while, right? Just get in the habit of doing that. Right? Get in the habit of thinking of noticing, praising, speaking respectfully and so on, right? The more you can develop this as a habit, the less you need to think about it and you just watch, watch your savings grow um, automatically. I talked about consulting a lot, so I'm not gonna talk about that again. Pick your battles, right? Some things are really important and need to be done and some things are really irritating and need to not be done. Um, but be mindful, be mindful of your relational credit with your kid. Right, and ask, do I want to burn relationship points on this right now? Or do I want to wait and do this when we're in a better place? Um, do I want to burn relationship points on changing this behavior because it's for the good of my child? Or do I want to prioritize and burn my relationship points on something else, right? But try, my goal is to stay well, well above zero uh, in relational credit. Right. And so if there are two things that are really important, I'm going to think about which one is going to be a bigger inconvenience and therefore a bigger withdrawal for my son. And then I think, like, does it feel worth it? And then I think, can I do both? And then I choose the one that I think is more important. And often I get tempted and I try the other one and then realize that was a bad idea. But at least, you know, spend a minute trying to pick your battles. Just speaking, noticing improvements and aiming for improvements rather than perfection is a big relief for everybody, for everyone involved, right? So if you want a behavior changing, setting as a goal, just an improvement gives you an opportunity both to feel like something improved, to feel like you succeeded, uh, and gives you a better chance of just hitting, hitting your goal. And then you can build in that momentum of success, right? If you want them to, to do an hour of homework when they get back home, perhaps you can agree that they'll spend five minutes, right? Starting with that rather than a full hour right away. That's that's hard for everybody, right? But after five minutes, 10 minutes is easy. From 10 minutes, 15 is acceptable. And then conversations will happen, right? Maybe it's enough, maybe not, right? But just thinking a lot in terms of uh, progress toward and, and seeing each step as a win not only thinking about the, the final destination. Minimum withdrawals, I mentioned this before, um, just you, you need to make withdrawals throughout the day in any relationship. It's just, it's just kind of how it works. Um, but if, if we're mindful about it, then we can just make these small withdrawals and it's nicer for everybody, right? Simple things, just being respectful, saying please. Um, saying thank you immediately after if they're, if they're doing what you asked. Um, simple things can help really minimize the impact of withdrawals. Uh, and, and then lastly, of course, making sure that you're taking care of yourself because when, when, you're, when you're depleted, everything becomes hard, right? And it's hard to be, for me, it's hard to be nice to other people. It's hard to be patient. Uh, it's hard to be thoughtful and considerate and mindful. And so this is really very much a put the mask on yourself. Uh, first kind of a situation. Like it's just, if if you're depleted, when I'm depleted, it's very hard for me to be a good person, the person I want to be, right? And so I'm not saying that me going to bed early is uh, sort of pro-social behavior, 
right? That I need to get a good volunteer award for, for setting a reasonable bedtime for myself. But it's part of the consideration. And especially if you're noticing, you know, you're snapping, you're angry or, or whatever it is, it may well be because of stress, because of fatigue, because of whatever's going on. And the more you can take care of yourself, the better you can, um, the more you can invest uh, consistently in your relationship with your kid. <sighs> Lastly, um, I think the more present we can be in our interactions with our kids, the better, or at least to set times to be present with our kids. So, you know, life happens all the time and huh, this didn't help. Life happens all the time and perhaps we need to interact with our kids when things are distracting and happening, but to at least set a time, some set aside some quality time, right? Good one-on-one, -on -one, no distraction time. Maybe you're playing a video game together. That's that's time too, right? But just time that you are focused on nothing but your kid, if you can. Like set dates with your kid if you don't have them, is my suggestion. Being explicit, I think, is a hugely powerful tool. For some of us, it's easier than for others. Um, some of us grew up with those, uh, and some of us didn't, right? But practice. Say, say what you're able to say, right? If you can say something like, you know, here's a sandwich I made for you because I want you to have a good lunch. If you can say, you know, I made this, I, I hope you like it, but tell me later so I can make sure you're enjoying yourself. Um, if you can say, um, I, I want to make sure you have a good experience at school. I really want you to, to enjoy it when you go there. What can I do? You know, what, whatever you can say and up to, you know, so this was kind of mushy two out of 10 and you can go to, to 12 out of 10 and they're like, I'm, I'm, and it's like, and that's okay. That's part of the relationship too. Um, but the more you can, the more you say it, the more they know it. Um, not all kids are telepathic. Um, and they kind of stop being telepathic around teen time, right? So they, they don't know it if you don't say it, even if it's very obvious to you. So the more you can say it, the better. And the more you can say that they did good things that impacted you, that really moved you, the better, right? Kids love being able to have an impact on their parents. It's a source of power. And one easy way to do it is to annoy the parents and see their buttons pushed and see their heads explode. And you're like, aha, I have power over this person. Boop, like that's great. But if you can give them the power to make you happy, that's equally important power. And isn't that a button you'd rather have pressed? And so see if you can find ways to, to show how positively they made you feel, right? Just like, like, Again, and this is different for some of us, it's easier than for others, but think how easy it is to show annoyance, right? When something is going wrong. And then I wonder then, is it possible? Is it is it equally easy for me to show satisfaction, to show pleasure, to show approval? Again, may, maybe it is for you and maybe it's not. Um, just a point to keep in mind. <sighs> Nearing the end here, um, default to following. Uh, I'm a big fan of following kids around, right? Basically, like if, unless it really matters, I'd rather do what, what my kid wants to do with my kid. And when it really matters, I prefer to do what my kid wants to do, but I'll consider not, right? Because like, what does my agenda have to do with it? This is in kind of leisure type situations. If there are things that are critical for me as an adult in my life, then of course I need to do what I need to do, right? But as far as free time and things that we could be doing, like why not do mostly what my kid wants to do? Like who's who's losing here? Um, following up is, is uh, both on things that you promised and also on things that your kid told you, that's a great way to show attention and to build relationship. Right. If they told you that they're going to be meeting with their friend Arnie, then at the end of the day to ask about Arnie, if you know that, you know, some they were looking forward to something that happened, and you can ask them about that later on. Um, it's just a big deal when somebody knows and when somebody's paying attention. And I put stuff, I put um entries in my calendar to ask my kid and my friends about things that they told me about. Right. If 
somebody's due to give birth on some month. Like I hear about the due date and I just put a reminder on the first of that month to like check in to see how they're doing. If somebody, you know, not, not my son, uh, obviously, but um, if, uh, if my son tells me that he's going hiking with a friend and I do or don't remember, right? I'll put a note and I'll be like, ask how that went. Um, just, just small stuff. And it's amazing, right? Because how nice it is to have somebody remember what, what we said uh, and come back to us two weeks later. It just feels special. Okay, these are all just kind of a smattering of tips. Um, but that's really all I had to say about this topic in general, thinking about the relational bank account, thinking about withdrawals and deposits, thinking about ways that we can deposit um, just in, in daily interactions and how to do that well, um, and how to minimize withdrawals, which are an important and necessary part of life.